guys hear me okay? Okay. So first off, I want to say that I'm from West Madison, and even on that side of town, you guys have a great reputation for being fantastic sports teams and having a ton of school spirit. So I'm really happy to come and see your school and talk to you a little bit about nutrition. Um, I'm also really excited because there's two things I love, and that's nutrition and exercise. Um, I've learned a lot of what I talk about by going to school and having great education, but I've also learned a lot by making a lot of really stupid mistakes in my training and my, my, eating, my eating plan. So hopefully I can prevent you guys from doing some of the same. I'm going to be up here for about 45 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about basic nutrition and then move into more sports-orientated nutrition, talking about pre-game fueling, um, post-game recovery. I'm also going to talk about supplements and a little bit about the uh, female athlete triad. I want to leave some time at the end for some questions or concerns that you guys have. It's a big group of students. You guys are doing a lot of different sports, so I'm not going to be able to address every individual sport with those individual nutrition needs as we go along. Okay? If you guys have questions or com comments uh, as I'm speaking, please feel free to politely raise your hand and I'll try to address those as we go along. before this my overview um, with questions and open table discussion at the end. So as I was saying there's a huge range of nutrition needs for different athletes. Um, a teen athlete could use could you need anywhere from like 1600 calories up to over 3000. So it's hard for me to say teen athletes need this many grams of carbs and this many grams of protein and this much fat each day. But I'm going to give you some formula so hopefully you guys can go home and figure that out. Um, so your nutrition needs are varied right now. The first, um, one of the most important things is for proper growth and development. We need to make sure that you're getting the right calories and the right amounts. Um, also along with those calories, we need to make sure you're getting adequate protein, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, and minerals. Okay? If you're heavy in one area and, and lacking in others, that's going to affect uh, sports performance, academic performance, and growth and development. Activity level plays uh, a big part into nutrition needs. When you guys are not in your sports season, um, how many of you guys are doing regular exercise outside of sports? Okay, maybe a quarter, half? So current recommendations are that kids and teens need at least an hour of activity every single day. Um, most kids aren't getting that. Many of the kids that I see in my clinic are, aren't doing much of anything at all. To go along with that one hour of exercise is a recommended less than two hours of TV or screen time. Any guesses on the average amount of screen time kids are watching? Five or more, yep. Over the summer I was seeing kids that were spending 8, 10, 12 hours a day playing video games and, and watching TV. So even when you guys are not in your sport, you should be training and exercising at least an hour a day and limiting your sedentary time to less than two hours a day. So the third part of that a caloric goal that nutrition needs is weight management. You've probably seen in the news that uh, childhood and teen obesity is a, a huge epidemic and so you're kind of hit with these two messages about being active and uh, controlling weight, but we also want to make sure we're not promoting unhealthy body image and weight reduction. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end. I'm going to start first with hy hydration. How many of you guys have heard ad nauseum, hydration, hydration, hydration? Okay, we're going to go over it one more time because it's really important. Um, your water weight counts for about 60% of our total body mass, and so even the slightest reduction, the dehydration can affect our sports performance. Um, it can lead to fatigue, um, increased cardiac stress, heat illness, a fluid loss of as little as 2%, so three pounds uh, in a 150 pound athlete, and you're gonna start to see those things happening. How many of you guys have been on the field or in the court, on the court and maybe felt a little dehydrated, a little low on energy? Okay, any of you guys get to the point where you're not sweating anymore? Feeling nauseated? Good, those were really bad things. So proper hydration needs to happen before, during, and after the event. It's not just a matter of guzzling um, water right after your exercise. How many of you guys are looking at your urine throughout the day? <laughs> Probably some more than others, right? 
So the color of your urine is a great way to judge your hydration status. When you go to the bathroom, it should be clear or almost clear, okay? If it's, if it's looking like Mountain Dew or dark lemonade, you're in trouble, you're already dehydrated. And if you're walking into a sporting event or um, an exercise session already dehydrated, you're setting yourself up for really poor performance. So when we're talking about hydration, we need to factor in a couple different things. Uh, one is your body mass. So you should be drinking at least half of your body mass in ounces per day. Okay. The next thing we need to think about is ambient conditions. Uh, it's been pretty nice the last couple weeks, but you know, a few weeks ago when the heat index was 110, you absolutely need more hydration. Um, for those of you that play sports that have uniforms that don't require a lot of breathing, thinking football pads and jerseys and all that, your fluid needs are going to be higher. Right, so the table didn't come across very well, but this is a table of uh, recommended hydration rates. Like I said, you shouldn't be playing catch up during or after your event. event. Um, trying to hydro a little like that can cause GI upset, upset and make exercise really uncomfortable. So the first thing you do when you get up in the morning should be have a glass of water. You should be drinking water throughout the day. Now, your schools, do you guys allow water in classes? Water bottles? Okay. That's great. So throughout the day, you should be drinking water. Uh, within my weight management clinic, I say you shouldn't be drinking any calories with the exception of milk. So while juice and Gatorade and that sort of thing will help hydrate you, there are extra calories that you, you don't need during the day. During the day, you should be drinking water. Uh, two hours before event, make sure to have a you know, full glass of water. And during the event, make sure you're taking a couple gulps of water each time you come off the field or out of the pool or off the court. Um, how many of you guys have sports managers that keep water bottles handy? Your managers do a good job of that? How many of you, where are the sports managers? <laughs> Thank you for keeping the teams hydrated, it's very important. Another way to ga uh, gauge your hydration status is to take your weight before and after an event. And for every pound that you lose, you should be drinking three cups of water. Okay. A lot of times with female athletes, especially we get kind of a high when we see that, that weight drop after an event or after exercise, it's water weight. And if we don't replenish that, we're not going to be able to play or exercise as hard the next time. Seriously, I don't think it likes this side. No? There we go. So I'm sure you guys have heard this message before too. Uh, the best hydration for most exercises or sports lasting, le lasting less than 60 minutes, all you need is water. Okay, you're not exercising or sweating hard enough that you need uh, to replace electrolytes in most in instances. Uh, the past month where it's been really hot and you're losing a lot of sweat, you can use these free, uh, calorie free electrolyte replacements if needed, um, but in most cases you're gonna be just fine drinking water. If you're exercising or your sporting events last more than 60 minutes and it's continuous exercise, not kind of sitting around waiting for the next event, then you can start looking at um, electrolyte replacement fluids. Um, I recommend not drinking anything more than 6 to 8% carbohydrates. If we're taking in carbohydrates that are higher than that, it's absorbed pretty quickly and it can cause gas and bloating and feel pretty miserable um, throughout the, the rest of the sport. So, you know, reaching for juice or certain energy drinks or lemonade, iced tea, those are not appropriate rehydration fluids. Um, if you're looking for something, I say recommend, I say uh, Gatorade, but uh, cut it with water, so 50-50 water and Gatorade. How many of you guys are, how many of your sporting teams use some sort of Gatorade, Powerade, something like that for replacement? Just a few, most of you guys using water? Okay, good. Okay, so the other big thing, it sounds like this is, you've kind of heard this before, but those excess calories are a big deal. Um, there was a big push a few years ago for vending machines to be put into schools, selling Powerade and Gatorade. It used to be soda. The Powerade and Gatorade companies are owned by Coca-Cola and Pepsi. So essentially what they've done is they've taken the soda out and they've put uh, sports drinks in which have the same amount of um, unneeded calories in most cases. 
So unless you're exercising for more than an hour, you don't need the extra calories from these sports drinks. Okay, so again, that being said, they should not be used as um, regular sports, uh, regular snacks or uh, lunches. So if you guys are packing your lunches, you don't need to be packing Gatorade, you don't need to be packing Power Bars. Um, those are tools that are used for sports recovery. And again, overuse of those products leads to excess weight gain. Even athletes can take in too many calories. Okay. So we talked a little bit about this, how to get the athletes drinking water. Um, keep plenty of bottles and, and um, refills on the court. Also remind your players and your teammates to keep sipping. Um, each time you have a chance, take a couple of swigs of water. Um, also, cool water works best. Generally, uh, water that's too cold or too warm can cause GI upset, um, or doesn't taste as well, and athletes are not as prone to, to drinking it. And lastly, set the example. Um, the teachers, parents, coaches in the building, make sure that the kids see you drinking water and not reaching for the uh, sports beverages or sodas. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit and talk specifically about carbohydrate, fat, uh, vitamin, and mineral needs for athletes. How many of you guys have had nutrition class in school? Health? You guys talk nutrition and health? Okay. Are you guys comfortable with the difference in carbohydrates, fats, and proteins? Okay. Okay. So carbohydrates are your body's preferred uh, fuel source. Your muscles can run on other fuel sources if they have to, your brain can't. So, you know, the fad diets, low carbohydrate diets, those aren't good for general nutrition or sports nutrition. Um, start cutting too many carbohydrates, it's essentially like emptying all the gas out of your car and then expecting your car to run. It's not gonna work. So carbohydrates could be, should be consumed as complex carbohydrates um, rather than the simple carbohydrates. Any excess carbohydrate that we don't need is going to get used, uh, which is the same for fat and protein. So stored, car uh, stored carbohydrate is called glycogen, and we keep it in our livers and our muscle. Um, it's depleted after about 60 minutes of exercise, which is in part why we don't need to refuel if we're exercising less than that. Um, you can train your body to store more, more glycogen uh, through proper athletic training and nutrition and also through carb loading. Um, Research is kind of out on carb loading, so I don't typically talk about it. I will talk briefly about it today. So carbohydrates should be about 50% of your diet, um, especially on your off season when you're not exercising quite as heavily. When you are exercising uh, more heavily, it can be anywhere from 60 to even 75% of your, your total intake. <clears throat> so if you look on a food label, you're gonna see your total carbohydrate grams. And if you take that times four, you'll get your calories and carbohydrates. So as young athletes, you should start looking at what you're eating and seeing how that's fitting into that mix of macronutrients. Okay. So a 140 pound athlete needs about 1,700 calories a day just from carbohydrates alone. I think one of the things that um, most young athletes are surprised by is the amount of calories that they need. So those complex carbohydrates are gonna come from your whole grains. Okay. School lunch program is under a really big reform right now and they are increasing your whole grains. You've probably seen that in your lunch program. Notice any changes? More whole grains. Okay. So these are those longer asking, acting carbohydrates. It takes your body longer to digest those. Those are gonna keep your blood sugar stable longer and help keep you feeling full longer. Um, when we need quick energy, we're gonna to turn to these simple carbohydrates. And these are not all created the same, so we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, your fruit sugars are going to be a little bit better for you, but you know when you're looking at food labels, anything that ends in OSE is a sugar. So I would encourage you guys to look at your labels, figuring out what you're eating, um, and looking at how many carbohydrates are in your diet and what kind of carbohydrates you're taking in. Protein needs for young athletes, not very different than anyone else. Um, again, at the top, it should be about 10, 10 to 20% of your total caloric intake. One gram of protein has about four calories, just like uh, carbohydrates. So we usually say about one gram per kilogram of body weight. Uh, 
Um, it's not uncommon to see weight gainers or protein supplements used in high school athletics and uh, even outside of high school athletics. Uh, but the truth is, if you're watching your diet, you don't need them. Extra protein is not going to do you any good. The extra calories, like I said earlier, will be stored as fat. Um, and if you're, you know, hyper-consuming these things, um, uh, uh, these protein supplements, you're only going to be absorbing about 25 to 30 grams at a time. Okay, and the rest really isn't utilized for protein synthesis, so it's kind of a waste. Uh, not to mention they're usually 30 bucks or more a tub. So when we're looking at protein, <laughs> there's lots of different options up there. Um, even, even people that are uh, vegetarian athletes can get their protein needs met through a balanced diet. So think about your school lunch today or the lunch that you packed today. What are some sources of protein that you had? What did you have in your sandwich? <laughs> Peanut butter and jelly sandwich. That's a great, great sports snack. Um, you've got protein in your peanut butter, but you've also got some protein in that bread, and hopefully it's a whole grain bread. Anyone else? No one else ate lunch? What did you have for lunch? Okay, a sandwich of summer sauces and cheese, great sources of protein. Okay. So take home message from this slide, your protein needs can met, be met through a balanced diet. There's no reason you need to, need to go out and buy these protein supplements. Um, meats, milk, eggs, uh, beans, your whole grains are going to have protein in them as well. Do you have any vegetarian athletes in the room? <laughs> Do you mind sharing uh, some of your protein sources? I'm sorry? You eat fish? I get many referrals for uh, vegetarian athletes and trying to figure out what they can eat, but there really are a lot of options there. Fat intake. Um, this is especially important for female athletes that uh, may be trying to cut fat. It's important that we have adequate fat in the diet, uh, both for overall nutrition, but also for vitamin and mineral absorption. There are some vitamins and mineral, vitamins especially that need fat to be absorbed. Um, and if we're cutting our fat uh, too, too low, that's going to inhibit our sports performance. So just as an example, 2,500 calorie diet, which would be pretty standard for most teen athletes, that's 70 grams of fat per day. Okay. There's a big difference in fats though. <laughs> exactly. These are the kind of fats that we do not want. Okay. Those fats are not doing us any favors. They're clogging up our arteries and not contributing a whole lot nutritionally. Um, what's really interesting is they've done studies, autopsies on children that have died at a young age, and they're already finding fatty deposits and arteries from fats like this, okay? So what you're eating now affects your, your health, your sports performance this weekend, but your health for the rest of your life. So we wanna go for those healthy fats up top, those un, unsaturated fats, um, so nuts and seeds, cooking oils except for coconut and palm oil, um, and fish oils. I'm going to switch over and talk a little bit about vitamins and minerals, uh, specifically the ones that many teen athletes uh, lack. So B-complex vitamins, have you, how many of you guys have seen the B-complex supplements in energy drinks or packets to add water or pills? No one's seen those? I see a couple heads nodding. So B-complex vitamins are important for energy production, but they don't give us energy. We're not getting any additional energy from those B vitamin supplements. They are used to help uh, with the reactions that create energy. B vitamins are really widespread in the diet, so if you're eating a balanced diet, again, with adequate carbohydrates, fats, and proteins, good variety, you're going to be getting adequate B vitamin. <clears throat> if you are a strict vegan, you may want to take a B12 supplement. Um, I'd recommend working with a dietitian if you're that strict on your intake. 
B12 is only found in animal products. Um, there's been some new research on vitamin E and vitamin C, which are antioxidants. So when we're exercising, we're creating free radicals that are causing oxidative damage to our cells. Um, and there's some, been some research about vitamin E and vitamin E supplements uh, to help that free radical damage. Research is spotty at best, so really no supplementation needed. Um, if you're, again, if you're getting adequate fats in your diet, you're going to get adequate E and C. Vitamin A, uh, need for, especially for bone and, and tooth development, so for you guys that are um, crashing into each other on the field or having high impact sports, we need to make sure those bones are as strong as they can be. Your bones are going to keep developing until you're about 20, 25 years old. After that, they're as strong as they're ever going to be. So right now is a really important time to make sure you're getting the, the exercise you need to stress the bones, but also the vitamins and minerals you need to rebuild the bones, um, which is a great lead into vitamin D. Um, vitamin D is pretty well fortified across the diet. So again, if you're taking it <clears throat> in a good variety, you're getting adequate vitamin D. Uh, we also create vitamin D in our skin. So, you know, 15 minutes of sunlight a day helps us create adequate vitamin D. And folate is needed for red blood, uh, blood cell formation. Um, you need red blood cells to transport oxygen. So if you are folate deficient, you can develop anemia. Um, really pretty common problem in female athletes. And um, if you are anemic, you are certainly not gonna be able to keep up on the, on the court or on the field. So if you guys um, kind of look at this page alone, you'll see that a lot of these vitamins are coming from fruits and vegetables. And teens are pretty notorious for not getting their fruits and vegetables. So that's one reason why we um, stress them so much. Calcium going along with that vitamin D for bone production, uh, sorry, bone growth. How many of you guys drink milk? Does your school have chocolate milk at lunch? Every day? Is it offered every day? Okay. Um, zinc and iron are often forgotten about. Uh, zinc is needed for protein synthesis. So, you know, if you guys are taking lots of protein supplements and trying to bulk up, but you're not getting zinc from your diet, you're not doing your body a whole lot of good. Uh, which is why, as a registered dietitian and um, an athlete, I always say food first, supplement second. There are many things you're, you're getting from food that you can't get. Um, and completion from your supplements. And uh, lastly is iron. So we need to make sure we're getting adequate iron again for oxygen trans, uh, transport. Most bioavailable are meat products, but again, if you're not a meat eater, there are ways to get iron, uh, beans, leafy green vegetables, dried fruits. Um, and females are at an increased risk for deficiency, um, partly because it's more common for female athletes to cut these foods out of their diet. Um, it's more common for female athletes to not be eating enough calories and menstruation uh, plays into this too. Okay, so that's a lot of information, a lot of numbers. If we pull it all together, you guys have probably seen the MyPlate. Have you gotten to that in health class yet? Yeah? yeah? This is a great visual uh, for you know, promoting healthy eating and also sports nutrition. Most of what we eat should be fruits and vegetables, about a quarter grain, mainly coming from those complex carbohydrate, and a quarter protein, and then adequate dairy. So we're going to look, uh, look at uh, some pre-game uh, fueling and some post-game recovery. How many of you guys have ever eaten or drinking like too close to your game and you just feel like crap? Full stomach? Anybody puke because you ate too soon? Too soon to your event? Yeah? I've done that before. Not fun. So three to four hours before your event, you should be having about 200 to 300 grams of carbohydrates. Another way to think of it is about 100 grams of carbohydrates for every hour before your event, up to about four hours. Okay? Um, it should be moderate protein and low in fat and fiber. Fat and fiber take long to digest and work its way through the digestive system. So if you're having a high fat, high fiber lunch, and then you're going out to try to practice or play game right after school, your stomach's still going to be working on those nutrients and you're probably not going to feel very comfortable. Okay? So there's an example of a uh, pre-game lunch. Sound like some, does it look like something you guys would eat? Pretty simple food, nothing special, nothing you have to go to GNC for. 
So pregame snack, 30 to 60 minutes before the game, you're gonna need some quicker energy, so we're gonna be looking for that high carbohydrate um, content. Moderate protein, and again, low fiber, low fat. Um, peanut butter and a bagel or a slice of toast with some banana. Banana is a great mix of those carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, but also cheese sticks, small piece of fruit, some crackers. Cliff bars and those kinds of things are okay. They wouldn't be my first recommendation. Um, try to promote regular foods as close to their natural state as possible, and cliff bars are pretty processed. And be sure to start hydrating. So with your snack, you should be having some water. Okay, this is where it got a little tricky. I wasn't real sure on this. Um, if your game or event lasts more than an hour, you might need to refuel. I would imagine that most of your events and games are not lasting an hour, so you probably don't need these. Um, but for those of you that are exercising for more than an hour, um, that's where you're gonna be looking at carbohydrate replacement every 30, 30 minutes or so. The goo packs can be an, op can be an option, sports drinks, small pieces of fruit, um, but that hydration is gonna be really important too. Is anyone in here doing exercise or events that last for more than an hour continuously? Yeah? Tournaments? Great. Okay. And you guys are exercising for more than an hour at a time? Okay, I wasn't expecting so many of you guys to be um, exercising that long. In those cases, I would go more towards like a piece of fruit, some sort of bar. Uh, the energy gels, they're an okay option. If you choose to do something like, that, something like that, you need to try it out before your major game or event. You don't want to walk into um, an event having tried it for the first time and realize that it doesn't work for you. Okay. Some of these products can cause gas and bloating and diarrhea. Okay. So try them out before you use them uh, in, a, in a real life situation. So post game recovery, it's important to have carbohydrates and protein within 30 to 45 minutes after your event or exercise. We need the carbohydrate and the protein for that uh, protein recovery. We need the carbohydrate to initiate the insulin response so that our body can use those nutrients that we're taking in. So four to one ratio, you guys have probably heard the chocolate milk. Yeah, yep. One of the best post-recovery uh, snacks, it's easy. Um, you guys have it here at school. You can also do uh, Greek yogurt with berries, um, you know, half a sandwich. How many of you guys have tried the Greek yogurt? A few? Great source of protein and calcium. Okay. And then that hydration piece again. Uh, get on the scale and for every pound that you've lost, make sure you're drinking at least three cups of water. So your post-game meal, generally you say wait a couple hours. If you go uh, try to sit down and have a big meal right after you've exercised really hard, um, you're not gonna feel great. You've got all that blood going everywhere else except for your gut, and if you dump a bunch of food into your gut, um, it tends to sit there. So um, this is where you're gonna do some of your carbohydrate reloading, making sure you're getting uh, good complex carbohydrates with adequate protein and adequate fat. Really, this is just a healthy meal. Going back to that plate where half of our um, plate is fruits and vegetables, we've got complex carbohydrates and a source of protein. So again, for parents and coaches in the building, this is probably not too far off what dinner meals are looking like. How many of you guys are doing carb loading? Or have the big pre-game pre spaghetti dinner? you okay so this is kind of a hot topic too the research is still out here um, carb loading can be effective if you do it correctly having a big pasta dinner the night before a meal is not carb loading correctly okay um, taking in all those carbohydrates can lead to water retention and feeling kind of sluggish and bloated so the new way to do carb loading is in two phases the first phase being about five to seven days before your event reducing your carbohydrate intake um, to a moderate level, so about five grams or about 50% of your uh, caloric intake. And then keeping your, your exercise at a moderate rate, okay, that's gonna cause your body to use up some of those glycogen stores in your muscle and your liver. And then phase two is really pushing that glycogen repletion, and that's gonna be days four up to the day before your event, where you're doing higher carbohydrate and lower exercise. Okay. So, like I said, the studies, 
are kind of out. They um, have shown mixed results. They really have not shown good results with female athletes, um, partially due to the estrogen cycling, and also because female athletes tend to not eat adequate calories anyway. So I put this more up here more for um, just kind of to plant the seed that that big pasta meal before an event that's not that's not proper carbohydrate loading. All right, so sports performance, these, um, you know, energy drinks, uh, protein supplements, weight gainers, fat burners, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. So one of the main things I want you guys to hear tonight is that these supplements don't have much regulation. The FDA, uh, the Food and Drug Administration, oversees prescription meds and they also see oversee the nutrition supplements, but they're under two departments, and the medication part, the prescription meds, have pretty tight regulatory processes. They have to be proven safe and effective before they go to the review board. Uh, these supplements that you're seeing at GNC or advertised on the radio, there's no oversight there. Uh, the only, the claims that these companies make are made by the companies. The uh, research is done usually by the company and promoted by, you know, celebrity or paid professional. It's not the same sort of um, regulation that you're going to get from medications that you get from your doctor. And as far as I understand it, most of them are banned or highly discouraged in um, high school and collegiate sports. So fat burners and uh, energy drinks, these make me especially nervous. Anything that's gonna raise the heart rate on top of already exercising, being hot, potentially being dehydrated, you have the potential to cause liver, kidney, and heart damage. Uh, also dehydration, malnutrition. You know, if you're, if you're relying on these energy drinks to get your energy, you're not taking in carbohydrates um, and vitamins and minerals, you're not getting the right kind of energy. So again, it looks like the table didn't transfer, but it's a chart um, showing a B12 supplement packet, which you can get at GNC or uh, the vitamin shop. This is a bowl of Cheerios, and half, uh, so one cup of Cheerios and half a cup of milk. And you can see that the, the B vitamin breakdown, the amino, I'm sorry, the amino acid breakdown is pretty similar, and you've got 50 cents a serving versus $1.50 uh, a serving. Also keep in mind when you're eating this bowl of cereal and your milk, you're getting calcium, fiber, carbohydrates, other vitamins and minerals that you're not getting in your supplement pack. So weight gainers, creatine, these kind of mass builders, um, really big, big amongst uh, male athletes especially. Um, really expensive, I was doing a um, market survey before I came and I couldn't find anything that was under 40 bucks. Um, you need to remember that adding mass is not the same as adding muscle mass. You can be taking in these extra calories with weight gainers, protein, and if you're not using them, the body's gonna store them, them as fat for you. And you guys know if you're on the field or court and you're trying to move around extra fat, that's a lot harder to do than move around extra muscle. Um, also excessive or rapid weight loss or weight gain can be hard on the bones and joints and some of the organ systems. So, Again, going back to the protein slide, your protein needs can be met through a regular diet. You don't need uh, weight gainers, you don't need protein supplements, you don't need creatine supplements, okay? If you're working on wanting to gain weight or even lose weight, recommend working with a dietitian. Uh, make sure there's an RD behind their name. Okay, anyone can call themselves a nutritionist, but dietitians have to pass an exam and have certain uh, credentials. And also don't wait until the sports season to make drastic changes in your weight. If you need to cut weight or gain weight, start preseason. So just like your training cycles, um, your nutrition needs are going to cycle too, and you should be thinking about that off season. So big take home message: supplements will not replace inadequate training for nutrition or inadequate rest. Got to come from nutrition. So switching gears a little bit, talk about just to, to the female athletes. How many of you guys have heard of the female athlete triad? Just a few, huh? Okay. So along the continuum of normal eating over here and disordered eating, the female athlete triad falls kind of in the middle there. 
Um, and it's categorized by um, prolonged energy, energy deficiency or not taking in adequate calories. Uh, especially for you guys that are training, you know, five or six days a week and competing, you need to make sure that you're getting adequate calories. <coughs> um, also categorized by menstrual disturbances. So if you're not having your period um, on a regular basis or not having it at all, that's a sign your body's telling you you're not taking an adequate fuel, you're not, um, you don't have adequate fat stores. Also bone loss and osteoporosis can be seen in young athletes. So these three together um, constitute the female athlete triad. Signs and symptoms. I want you guys to think, you women, to think about um, time on the field and how you're feeling. There's gonna be times where you're tired and fatigued, but if you're you know, constantly feeling stressed, tired, uh, you're not eating, you feel like you have to exercise all the time, those might be signs or symptoms that your training and eating are a little off, off kilter. Some risk factors. Um, I wanted to point out especially some of the sports and activities that increase risk factors for a female athlete triad. And I'm also going to throw in there that male eating disorders among athletes are on the rise. And so for um, those of you that have male athletes uh, in running or dance, um, wrestling, um, be mindful of the messages that you're sending about body size and shape and nutrition with those athletes. If you suspect that your athlete um, isn't eating enough or um, may have some health consequences based from their, their diet and exercise, see your pediatrician, uh, see a dietitian or a mental health provider. So lastly, I've got a couple of resources up here for nutrition. Uh, first place I'd direct you to go is the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. That's the uh, oversight body for dietitians. Um, within the academy, we've got SCAN, and so they speak specifically to exercise and sports nutrition. They've got some great um, meal plans on their website for athletes that are looking to gain weight, lose weight, um, endurance athletes information on the female athlete triad. Also the USDA is a good uh, resource. How many of you guys have spent any time on myplate.gov? What have you guys found on myplate? Myplate.gov? Yeah. It's, I'm, I'm glad you looked at that. On myplate.gov, you can actually type in your age, weight, exercise level, and it's going to give you a calorie level. So you can start looking at what percentage of your calories are coming, like we were talking about, from fat, carbohydrates, and proteins. But myplate.gov is a good place to go get that basic information. Um, and again, on the bottom, if you're going to work with a dietitian, make sure they're a registered dietitian, um, not just a nutritionist from a sports supplement store. Okay. Questions? So I've had a couple uh, teenage athletes come to me specifically asking about this list of supplements that they're taking. Um, some of the things I see most common are fat burners or energy supplements like Red Bull or um, Five Hour Energy. Um, and you know, going back to that supplement, supplement list, none of those things are really regulated. Um, the studies that they do have, I, I said, are usually funded by the company. They're using adult subjects, so we don't know for sure what effect that has on teen bodies. Your organ systems are still developing, so if you're dumping a bunch of you know, caffeine or extra protein or extra creatine into your body, uh, we don't really know what that's doing to developing bodies. Yeah, I'm, say that again? I say food first, supplement second. Um, I think that if you really pay attention to what you're eating, you can get your needs met without supplements. Um, that being said, if you categorically don't like milk, or you don't eat a lot of meats, or you really hate fruits and vegetables, it might not be a bad idea.
If you have the opportunity to pack uh, things and bring them with you, I would recommend that uh, for cost and you also know what's going into it. Like I said, chocolate milk's a great post-recovery drink, but if you got you know an hour to travel back, you can pack small sandwiches, a couple pieces of fruits, um, some granola bars, do you want to be careful on the sugar there. Um, if you have to stop somewhere, I don't know about um, your teams, but when I was in team sports, we usually stopped and we always went to fast food. A better choice would be something like McDonald's. Um, <laughs> I'll go to McDonald's. Um, Subway. Subway, uh, Subway or somewhere where you can build, you know, your meal. Um, what I wouldn't recommend is doing what we did and packing our coolers full of pretty junky granola bars and fruit snacks and soda. And, um, those are not appropriate post-exercise uh, post foods. Amanda, can you tell us a little bit more about the um, about the caffeine supplements? You know, there's there's a product like Red Bull mm -hmm. and Amp and uh, the Five Hour Energy, and there is occasion that I'm walking through the locker room and I see some empty bottles of those things laying around. Talk to us about the long term effect on a teenage body with those kind of products. So, for any of you guys that are using, you know, Amp or Monster, Five Hour Energy, coffee. Um, you've probably noticed that it increases your heart rate, okay? So as you're going out into the field and you're getting ready to exercise, you're already raising your heart rate. Um, it's still pretty darn hot outside, so heat increases the risk for dehydration. Um, if you're constantly relying on caffeine to get you through your exercise or your sports, um, you have the risk of developing like tachycardia, which is a high heart rate, uh, so a racing heart which can, if you um, allow it to go on too long, um, can cause you to pass out or get dizzy, decrease sports performance. Um, also, it's only going to last about 30 to 40 minutes, and then after that you're gonna need some more uh, energy. So that should be coming from those complex carbohydrates, those simple carbohydrates when appropriate. Um, it should also be noticed that, noted that caffeine decreases calcium absorption. So if you're sucking down caffeine every day, you're not absorbing calcium like you should be, uh, which increases your risk for bone breaks. I think there's a question in the third row here. Did you have? You're absolutely right. Um, I shouldn't be so categorically negative on fast food. If you go in there and you have the willpower to read the menus and really think about the best choices in there, you can make healthy choices there. Um, but you have to make an effort to do that. So thank you for bringing that up. Any other questions? Let me back up a little bit and say pasta dinners aren't bad the night before, but I don't want you guys leaving here thinking I'm going to carb up, I'm going to carb load and have a big pasta meal before my event and that's going to change my body chemistry somehow. Um, a pasta dinner the night before a race is a, a decent uh, option. Um, limit your portions to about a cup, cup and a half and then make sure you've got some protein, so some lean ground beef or some turkey mixed in there and also some, some vegetables. Are you a runner? Yeah, so carbohydrates would be a good, good choice for you. Okay. Other questions? Amanda, can you, talk, can you talk a little bit about the recent concerns on steroid use in males and females? I'm sorry, about steroid use? Yes, in males and females. Um, sure, I've actually I've seen less of it um, in my practice, but um, have you guys had education on steroid use? Right, so you guys know side effects? Yeah, acne, uh, rages, changes in emotional behavior, right? Changes in sexual organs, okay? Those steroids, um, again, there's no regulation. Um, you're injecting or consuming materials above and beyond what your body needs. Um, and generally, when you stop taking them, if you're not training and eating right, muscle mass is going to um, 
to diminish anyway. So there's absolutely no reason you need to be taking um, supplements, uh, steroids of any kind. Um, I was reading recently a, an investigative study that showed that a lot of the weight gainers have steroid or steroid-like components in them. And so you may be taking those without realizing it. So again, another reason to just leave the supplements at the store and focus on good nutrition. Anything else? In terms of kind of general nutrition, yeah. um, peanut, I've heard peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, great choice. Um, peanut butter and banana sandwiches, um, some whole wheat crackers and some low-fat cheese. Um, you can make things like whole grain rice or quinoa in bigger batches and keep that portioned out or frozen so that all you have to do is throw it in the microwave. Um, cereal and milk is a great combination of carbohydrates and protein. Does that give you some ideas? Um, I have seen it used, especially like in Iron, Ironman events, a great example this past weekend. Soda is, it's a great source of quick carbohydrates, but it's not the right kind of carbohydrates that a teen athlete needs. Um, I wouldn't recommend it for an adult athlete either. There are better choices. Um, he or she had a great point in that it's quickly absorbed. It's great to get another boost going if you're exercising for hours, um, but I certainly wouldn't recommend it for teen athletes. I just need you for two more minutes, so sit down. Thanks. Okay. Um, just want to thank Amanda for, for coming and sharing with us a lot of valuable information. And Amanda, since you put your phone number on there, does that mean we can call you? <laughs> sure, that's the reception desk. Feel free to call. <laughs> Great. Call the reception desk. But let's give her another round of applause. Really appreciate your expertise. There's a couple of pieces I want to share with you. Um, we are, we are a member of the Wisconsin Interscholastic Athletic Association, the WIA. We are all members. Our school's a member. And what that means is the website that they have available is a website that's, accept, that's uh, accessible to all of us here. My recommendation is that all of you students, coaches, parents, please spend some time looking at that website. There are some wonderful resources. Uh, Sarah had uh, mentioned it as well. But there's two things I want to point out to you. You may not realize this, but our state association does have a list of banned substances. Uh, there's a brochure you can get off their website. I have a few copies left over by Coach Swanson in the back, but there's some things that are banned to not be in your bodies at all, member schools, and there are substances that are discouraged. And the most important part is, as a member school, we do not endorse any products. Goo, Gatorade, Coke Black, any of that stuff. Um, I, I want to share a couple of things with you here. This is on the discouraged list. Schools may not provide in any shape or form things like creatine, no dose, protein powders, any caffeine supplements, things like energy drinks like Red Bull, Amp, Advanced, uh, if Coke Black is even made anymore, that type of product. So as a school, we're never gonna endorse that stuff. So when, when uh, Amanda had asked if uh, you guys use some products or that thing, I was glad to see that uh, there weren't a lot of people raising their hands because we don't want to endorse those things. There's things we can do by making better choices about what we eat. Um, I have copies of this too if you'd like to get, uh, to get that information as well. Um, we train hard, we work hard as a team, we put a good uh, experience on the field for our kids. We gotta make sure we take care of things nutritionally wise to help us be at our best, so that's what this part is about. And before we, we get you out of here, just got a couple announcements. So um, there's a Cardinal Parent Meeting going on in the Media Center. And Coach Rob Hamilton is the guest speaker tonight. Um, 
you might be able to catch him if, if uh, he's still in there. I also want to draw your attention to one more thing, parents, athletes, coaches. Tuesday, October 16th, right here at 6.30, we have a gentleman named Jack Rankus coming, and his, his conversation with us is going to be about college recruiting realities. Whether you think you want to play college ball, or you're just thinking, gee, there might not be a place for me, but maybe there is. He's not a recruiter. He doesn't work for a college. He's not going to guarantee anything, but what he wants to do is come to educate you, whether you're in 7th, 8th grade, whether you're a senior. He wants to educate you. What is this college recruiting game all about? And if you really want to play ball at the next level, there may be a school for you, and here's some ways you can navigate the process. The percentage of us in this room that are going to be a Badger is very small. It's probably just one seat at best. But those of us that want to go on and play at the next level somewhere, Division II, Division III, junior college, NI, uh, uh, NAIA schools, there are opportunities for you. And so that's what his talk is going to be about. So it's, it's well worth your time. Um, we'll be setting a Blackboard Connect on that. Uh, the last thing is uh, coaches and teachers that are doing my learning plan, please just sign up with Coach Swanson um, on your way out. We have a form for you to sign. But thank you so much for making this a priority tonight.